Hey, good morning, Keith. Good morning, Brandon. How are you? I am doing fantastic. I'm hoping that anybody that watches this isn't blinded by the, the stripes in my purple. Polo. It's all I can bear. Really. <laughs> well, and I, I'm trying not to pay too much attention to the, the, the bookshelf behind you. The mess? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so today I was hoping we could talk a little bit about fatherhood. Uh, I'm sure you're aware that Marcellus Wiley, who is a political comment, uh, now a political commentator, yeah, now. A, a, right, a sports commentator who um, played in the NFL and graduated from Columbia University, but also came from Compton, right? He became real famous real quick for anybody who didn't already know who he is because he came out strongly against the BLM organization. Obviously, as a black man, he's not against black lives, right? But he's not favorable for that or with that organization because they are um, statedly so against the nuclear family and hope to tear apart the nuclear family, to destroy the nuclear family. And as he argues, he thinks his success is based in the reality that he had both mother and father in the home who supported him and, and all that. So I know that over the past couple of weeks, that's been a real controversial topic. And so I wanted to just take some time to talk with you about fatherhood and do fathers matter? Uh, it, do fathers have value? And if so, how and what and all that? What say you? Yeah. Well, a lot of us knew who Marcellus Wiley was long before this. You know, watched him play, but I mean, I've been following him on Twitter for a while because he's just always makes sense. Long before this came along, just always intelligent, well spoken, logical, makes sense. Maybe this he is because a, I, but he is a Clippers fan, so that's <laughs> a little shaky, you know, right there. But hey, somebody has to be. <laughs> well, and uh, you know, so he said that, and of course, he he got canceled. Uh, by a lot of people in a hurry, but um, but it is true uh, the value of fathers, and um, and that has been seen. You know, it's been seen, ironically, I think maybe even more so in the absence of fathers. Have we recognized their value? Um, because the feminists, especially, uh, were kind of on a tirade against men in general, but especially fathers. We don't need fathers. We do this on oursel ourselves. And I suspect that was born out of the other extreme mm -hmm. where men were, you know, women don't matter. Women can't even vote. Um, you know, there have been some that who thought a you know, woman was nothing more than just soil for the sperm. And, uh, and so, you, when you, you know, extremes beget extremes. Yeah. So you've got that extreme that in, I feel like in some ways begat the extreme of feminism. We don't need men. We can just somehow... And here we are, and um, I think more than any other way, we've recognized the value of fathers is in their absence, because I don't know that we've ever had more absentee fathers. Oh, yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, the, the stats, I think, bear out um, unquestionably that things are better when fathers are in, and I appreciate you mentioning the mothers, because uh, our <clears throat> conversation about fathers in no way, shape, or form is intended to ignore or dismiss the value of mothers. It's just that we both know that if there is a single parent family, in almost every case, that single parent is a mother. So then the question becomes, you know, are we okay with that? Like, is that, is that how, should that be the American ideal? Only mothers, no fathers anywhere. Or, or is there some importance to having fathers in the home, helping in their families, to support their wives and and help raise their kids. So what do the stats say about this? Yeah, well, I, I looked up a few stats um, and it came from the internet, so it's gotta be right. But, <laughs> uh, for fatherless children, uh, the suicide rate is 63% higher than those who don't come from fatherless rates. Uh, this is comparing fatherless versus with fathers. Uh, runaways are 90%. 90% of all homeless and runaway youths are fatherless. 71% um, of all high school dropouts, fatherless. Uh, juvenile detention rates among 
uh, juveniles in state operated institutions who came from a fatherless environment is 70%. And so the stats, you know, they just go on and on and on. And um, we talk about all, all kinds of uh, ramifications that come from not having a father. Now you might look at it objectively and say, surely he's not that important. And you could, you could be maybe justified in feeling that way, but all of the statistics would say that's not the case, that he really does matter. Now, would it be similar if we had a ton of motherless homes? Perhaps because of the value of a mother. We just don't, you know, uh, the biology of it says that, I mean, this is my child. I gave birth to it. The father doesn't even have to be around. He could nine months ago, he's, he disappeared, but there's always going to be that mother. And our, that's why we love our mother so much. I think just because that inherent um, connection, whereas the father biologically, logistically, every other way doesn't really have to be around. So we don't have the statistics for motherless situations, but I wouldn't be surprised if it w wasn't something similar. Mm -hmm. And if it would have been, it does make us realize that God's design of man and woman, which is the only way, I know there's a lot of agendas out there, but literally the only way you're going to get another human being is with a man and a woman. And uh, if that's God's design, it sure appears to be a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. That it, it's, it's a, to, to highlight one is into, dismiss the other sure. and and it is to then say what is the combined value of those two you know um, I've, I've got this interesting thing that I, i've said for a long time because i think there's some truth to this and you can tell me whether or not this makes sense in, even with your own upbringing but uh I, i've got this rule which is that children learn how to follow rules from their mother and they learn how to make their own rules from their father. And where I get that from is this, in almost every family that I'm aware of, the mother gives incredible detail to her instruction. Okay, kids, tomorrow morning, I want you to get up at this time, I want you to get these clothes out, I want you to put this in your backpack, I want you to da 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 da, da, da right? And by contrast, the dad's like, I'm leaving at 7.30, be in the car. <laughs> Right? Yeah. I mean, are there exceptions to that? Yes, there's exceptions to that. But as a rule, mothers tend to give lots and lots of detail. And fathers tend to just be more bottom line, you know, here's the point. If you're cold, you know, put a coat on. But otherwise, I'm not going to tell you which coat, tell you, ask you if you grabbed your coat, et cetera. And so the combination of those two things, when you have mother and father, the children learn both how to follow rules, right? All these little details. Okay, mom says, put, you know, get the toothbrush out and then, do, you know, right? But then from the father, you learn in the absence of those specific details, how to get to the end result through your own initiative, through your own judgment, through your, um, you know, piecing these things together, right? Okay, so dad says, I got to be dressed. What clothes do I pick? <laughs> you know, and so I think the combination creates a very well-rounded child. Yeah. I think what I hear you saying is balance. Yeah. There's a there's a balance there, and you know, um, child skins their knee, runs. Guess who they run to? <laughs> I remember as a young father, child got hurt, and I'm right there, and oh, what's wrong? And I hold my hands out, and they go right past me, three rooms away to go find the mother. And you know, the difference is, uh, and these are general differences, but they're gender differences. The mother's going to be carrying and, you know, oh, let me see that. And let's get some, a band aid. And dad's going to be, doesn't look that bad. You're okay. Rub some dirt on it, you know? Okay. And, and honestly, in re in the reality of real life adulthood, you need to be able to care. Yep. You also need to be able to rub some dirt on it sometimes and go on about your business. And that's where you, when you bring both genders into the equation, you bring all of those characteristics as different and as opposite as they are sometimes, you bring all of that to the table and you end up with a lot of balance. That's right. And so with a single parent, and there's nothing wrong with single parents, some are just that way out of necessity. Some are the other per, parent is in the house, but they're still 
you know, pretty much a single parent. So there's a lot of different ways this plays out. But if there's only one predominant influence in that child's life, then obviously they're going to take on primarily only those characteristics. Uh, right. Yeah. And I like how you, I like how you mentioned, it's not just whether or not there's another human in the home. It's whether or not there's another engaged human. Yeah. In the home, right. Yeah. yeah. Because it's really not a matter of just, is the father present or not? That's one factor, but it's the engagement of that father. So it's fathers who are engaged that make a difference versus fathers who are not present and fathers who are not engaged. Yeah. Well, and you mentioned a minute ago about the BLM and their, one of their stated objectives is to uh, pretty much destroy the nuclear family, and uh, which is a pretty bold statement and, and obviously more transparent than I would expect that they would be. But I read recently, and this was on Twitter, but it was a journalist, and I think, um, well, he's Asian, so I think that his ethnicity is uh, relevant here. He's not a black man saying this or a white man. He's Asian. He's saying, but you have to understand, the, the current nuclear family is a, a mid-50s North American white construct. So when you talk about destroying that, you're really only talking about destroying something that's very, very generalized, very short term. This is what he said. Mm -hmm. And he was sort of defending their statement, we want to destroy this nuclear family. Okay, I, I'm not sure where he... <laughs> yeah, exactly, that. exactly. But, uh, he, but he was on the internet. <laughs> I guess. But, you know, the nu as we would refer to the nuclear family, it goes all the way back to creation. Correct. Unless you don't believe in creation. And see, this is where, you know, a person's worldview about origins really comes into play in a lot of different ways. But this goes all the way back. It was Adam and Eve and their children. And, and this is not some modern construct. This is what God's plan has always been. <clears throat> and for those of us who believe that, that makes a big difference. And so to be involved in that is important. Well, yeah, not only does it um, make a big difference, it works. It works. It works. That, that's, so, so here's an interesting thing, and I'm going to do two things right now with a comment. So first of all, you just rattled off some incredibly powerful statistics at the beginning of this, right? And so from, a, from virtually every statistical standpoint, fatherhood, you know, present engaged fathers make a positive difference from every, every imaginable statistical point of view. But then there is the personal experience as well, right? So there's the stats. And then if you just narrow it down to your own, own experience, as you mentioned, we love our mothers, but how many people also love their dads, right? And find that their dads, you know, help them in so many different ways, right? I, uh, earlier this year, I, I did a month on, you know, I do these themes on Facebook every month, right? And I did one on masculinity matters. And it was a great mental exercise for me because it gave me an entire month just to think about the things that we typically are thankful, whether they're small or big, about, about fathers. And so I'm going to mention some things on my list, right? So for anybody who doesn't know, I, I wasn't raised by my father. I don't know who my father is. But I was raised by my grandparents. And so my grandfather was the father figure in my life. And number one, when that bike, is, when that bike has a flat, right? dads matter you know so yeah. um it's one of the things i remember learning from my grandfather and y you know when when you're a boy and your bike tire is flat and you're shut down right you know all your freedom is attached to that and you don't go to mama yeah <laughs> no no when you fall off the bike and get hurt you go to her <laughs> but when the bike is hurt you go to him you see. <laughs> hey i like that did you just make that up right now i just made it up you know well done. Well done. On that. <laughs> but um, when something goes bump in the night, right? You know, dads matter. Um, when that toy is labeled some assembly required. Which is always a lie. 
<laughs> right? I mean, you think about, you know, Christmas morning, right? Everybody's in a joyous mood, right? And then you've got dad over in the corner with a stack of, you know, parts. <laughs> and 12 left over when he thinks he's finished. <laughs> right? And, and, you know, I don't want to, you know, but – but there's these things that happen on a daily basis where it's like, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. You know? Yeah. I remember when I was first out of college, I got a job and um, it was very blue collar technical. I mean, uh, you know, mechanical type stuff. And this guy I was working with, he didn't have a clue. And I walked in, I knew, already knew what I was doing. He was like, how do you already know how to do that? And it literally had never crossed my mind that somebody might not know how to do those things. And it was because of my dad. Yeah. And it was just in the course of life, you know, uh, that I learned these things. And, um, and so, uh, you know, the, again, only in his absence are we really made aware of his value. Right. And so you know, we, we've got to, I think we need to stop listening to the culture that says masculinity is toxic. Yes, there are definitely some male jerks. They're toxic, but it's not because they're masculine. They're toxic because they're jerks. Right. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need masculinity. We need the fathers and, and, uh, and mothers cooperating. Because what happens is you create a cycle. So if a fatherless, here's how it typically goes, a fatherless home, and you have a son who doesn't have any example for a male role model. <clears throat> he doesn't have somebody who's going to, you know, snatch a knot in his shirt tail when he, you know, there's a certain fear of the father versus of the mother. Uh, the girl has not received love from a man. And so when she reaches a certain age, there's some things she's willing to do, willing to trade for what appears to be love, right. uh, which often leads to more fatherless children. And so the, the cycle just keeps going around and around and around. And unless somebody steps in and breaks that cycle, I mean, we're talking generations of the same thing and we're seeing that we're seeing that now, but not only in this country, I see it in other countries as well. And the common denominator, there is a lack of a father an engaged father who really cares being in the home. You you mentioned um, the, this idea of modeling, right? Father to the son, modeling. One of the things that I do my best to try to help people to get is it's very hard to grow up to be a theoretical concept, right? So somebody tells the boy, you need to be responsible or, or uh, uh, you need to cowboy up. You need to whatever, whatever the phrase is. It's so difficult to grow up to be a concept it's much more tangible. And I think what happens most of the time is we grow up to be something we've seen. We mimic something we've seen, yeah. whether we're talking how we dress, how we act, how we mm -hmm. talk, we mimic something we've seen. And so the absence of a father creates a vacuum whereby that boy will either um, have a positive influence fill that vacuum or a negative one, but it, it it becomes very sketchy at that point, right? You know, who who is that influence? Is that influence some athlete? Is that influence some celebrity? Is that influence the local drug dealer in the neighborhood? Who is that influence that replaces the father that's supposed to love that 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 son? And so that's huge. It's huge. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you, you've taken on some traits of your grandfather unintentionally. I mean, I know that you get up really early. You get up earlier than probably anybody I know. And, you know, he's the first person you saw do that. And uh, I remember one time, it's been 20 years ago, or maybe more than that, my brother called me one day and uh, he said, I'm turning into dad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he had just said something, something happened. And he, he responded the exact same way our dad would. Yeah. I was like, yep, I guess it's inevitable. Right. You know, and, and that's not genetic. That's environment, you know. Yeah. And so what are these traits? Is it a vice? Is it an addiction? Is it a, a temperament? Is it a work ethic? Uh, you know, is it a, a general demeanor? Whatever it is, we, we end up taking on these uh, characteristics, not genetically, 
but environmentally as well. And that's why, you know, both having both is important because you bring all of those, even the gender differences, because while we do need to rub some dirt on it, we need to also be tender and caring, yeah. uh, both, both, you know, both genders. And so uh, that's where it all comes into play because we just, we, we get this all environmentally, or, or I would say much of it environmentally. Yeah, well, and then, or, you know, you mentioned uh, indirectly the teen pregnancy issue, right? So there's, there, there is, and, and maybe at some point we can run this back and talk specifically about, you know, parenting sons and parenting daughters and, and all that. But, but you think about the, the young lady who grows up, as you said, not having been loved by a man, right? And how thirsty and in some cases desperate they are for that attention and so some knucklehead at high school says a couple of nice things and next thing you know you've got a new teen pregnancy it's one of the reasons why i believe that involved um, fathers are the greatest deterrent to teen pregnancy yeah yeah absolutely she needs to know how to she doesn't even know how to be treated by a man That's right. if there's not an active caring engaged father in the home she doesn't know how she should be treated so any kind of treatment just kind of sets the benchmark and now here's the benchmark and it's and it should be here but it's really here because that's all she really knows and she just settles for what feels like uh fulfilling this inherent need to be loved by a man and it's not even love for him it's probably not love but he's willing to trade what she wants for what he thinks you know for what he wants for what she thinks she's getting yeah yeah it, for, for for the the high school classmate, it's nothing but, you know, what, what keys do I need to unlock, you know, yeah. the door to, to get what I want, you know? Yeah. And obviously, you know, we, we know for those who are watching, we're speaking in generalities. There are always going to be exceptions. We're not, these are not blanket wholesale statements, but these are generalities. And I think the statistics and experience, you know, bears it out that, uh, the boys raised with a father don't know how to, a, a real man should behave often. They have to find it out from somebody else. Hopefully sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. And then often a girl doesn't know what it's like to be loved by a man and, and how she should expect to be treated by a man. Add in domestic violence and things like that because moms maybe had several different men come and go and they've never been high quality and they, they treat her badly. So now that's her expectation. This is just the way it happens because it's all she knows. You know, the definition of normal is what's what you expect. I mean, it's, it's what's new, you know, what has come to be normal for you is normal. And what we've got to do is like really raise the bar of normalcy. Yeah. Well, let's, let's pivot into that, you know, so, so, it's it's pretty clear that fathers have value, right? So let's take what you just said and transition into this idea. How can men bring value to being a father? What say you? Well, yeah, and, and it's more than just showing up, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or being there. Okay, I'm, if you're there, that's probably better than not being there, but maybe not. I mean, there obviously there are fathers that it really would be, everybody would be better off if he were not there, if he's not going to change. But we're going to stick with the, the general assumption that's better that he's there, but that just being there doesn't do it. In fact, one of, the, um, one of the biggest complaints of wives, so it's a wife, so there's a, there's a husband there who is yeah. probably the father, is passivity, male passivity is one of the biggest complaints of, of wives and um, he's there, but you know, he just doesn't want to do anything. Mm -hmm. And it's the end of the day and I'm tired. I've worked all day. And, you know, and so there's a, maybe a disciplinary need that needs to be dealt with or came up or some uh, the kid wants to throw the ball, uh, whatever the little girl wants to play, you know, with her little game in the floor and he's not, he just doesn't want to do it. He's so he's there but he's passive. And that's one of the biggest problems in two parent homes is male passivity. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
you know, and it's, it's, yeah, we are tired at the end of the day. Maybe it's been a stressful day and we just want to come home and sit down and relax and not deal with all that. But hey, man, it's, t- it's time to man up. I mean, yeah. literally, it's time to father up. <laughs> and yeah, okay, maybe you take a few minutes. Maybe you've got it worked out with your wife. Just, just give me 15 minutes, you know? Yeah. And then, we're, then I'm in. Uh, but that's where you have to do it. She's tired too. Yep. Uh, what do you think she's been? I mean, I don't know what she's been doing all day, but she's probably tired too. Yep. So uh, it's really not a good excuse. But of the two parents who are more likely, typically speaking, of the two parents who are going to be, which one's more likely to be passive and inactive and not really engaged? It's going to be the dad almost all the time, which is a shame. So uh, get off the couch, you know, get involved and, uh, and, and fight the desire, the, the inherent desire to just be passive. Uh, that's one thing I would suggest. What about you? Oh, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Well, you, you like, if we walk back, to this idea that when fathers are not there, how it, how the modeling isn't there, right? So then you have to then ask the question, if modeling matters, men need to be the best models they can be, right? And one of the things that I've um, talked about this male passivity in the home, especially after work hours, it's one of the reasons why I think dads need to be engaged, but they also need to help their sons to be engaged when they get home from school. Because I, I, I quite often think that the son trans, so, so if I'm a boy in the home and I'm expected to do well in school, but after I get home, I have no responsibilities in the house. I will then grow up to be a man who thinks all I do is work. And then when I get home, I do nothing. Well, what's the best mechanism for that boy to learn that it's to be given chores and and responsibilities, but it's also for him to see his father participating with, with the children and with other things in the home when they get home from work. And I'll I'll say one other thing that I'll turn it back over to you, which is why men need to be healthy. Men need to be healthy because one of the key reasons for bad parenting is just sheer fatigue, as you talked about, being tired. But you are more likely to be tired if you're unhealthy than you are if you're healthy, right? right? I mean, right. Stam- stamina isn't by accident, <laughs> right? And so being able to push through another two, three, four hours in your day is almost entirely related back to your mental and physical health. Yeah, and willpower. Oh yeah, yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah just not giving in to. Uh, so we're we're gonna tell our children. Well, you there are gonna be times you don't want to do something, but you're gonna need to do it. And he says it while he's just sitting on the couch every evening, not doing what he knows he needs to do. You know, so you know the the inconsistency is going to be pretty obvious. It's like the father said, we tried and tried to teach our children good table manners, but they still eat like we do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know? And so they're going to pick those things up regardless. And, um, and, and that's where, you know, to be engaged, to be active. Uh, and I, I would say also, so maybe he has come from a cycle. Yeah. Maybe he's part of a cycle. Maybe his dad was verbally abusive. Uh, maybe he was lazy. Maybe he had a, some addiction that really affected his relationships in the home and, and elsewhere. Maybe he wasn't uh, one who hugged, wasn't affectionate, wasn't complimentary. I don't know. I mean, you name it. Yeah. We're all a product of our environment. So we sometimes I've heard of people halfway excuse a man. Well, he just didn't have a good father to teach him. And I, and I get that. And my, uh, you know, I, I feel bad for him about that. But if he is intentional enough about it, he can begin creating those traits that he would want to see uh, in himself and then also in his children and then theoretically even in his grandchildren for generations to come. But you have to be the cycle breaker. That's right. And so I'll just use one example. My, my father's father was not affectionate. He came from the old country and literally. And men didn't do that. Men didn't show affection. Uh, and he, I, so my dad never received that from his father, but somewhere along the way, he was a cycle breaker. 
because not only was he a hugger, he hugged you so hard it would hurt, you know, because he was, he was a big man. And he would hug you, and he would, uh, I remember him as a boy, oh, don't kiss me on the cheek, but you couldn't stop him, you know? And, um, and so those are the things that he, he broke the cycle. And it's, so it's natural for me now. And so I think if a man needs some motivation who didn't get that, he needs some motivation, why don't you just aspire to be the one who breaks the cycle and specs the bad cycle and begins a good one that could theoretically last for generations. Oh yeah. See, that's, that's so powerful, right? We should be able to look back at our dads and say, what good did I learn? And what bad did I get as well? Because I, my father was imperfect. Keep the good and improve on the bad. Yeah. Right? And, and that is why, you know, I think about, you know, what we feed ourselves as men. And I'm not just talking the food at the table. I'm talking, what books am I reading, right? What, what information, what, what are the friendships that I'm acquiring? And is all that healthy? Because what I didn't get from my dad, I may be able to get from someone else. So that, wow, you know, uh, my dad wasn't affectionate. And so I'm, it's not my tendency. But man, that King Kasarjian guy, he's so affectionate with, it, with his kids. And, and they seem to really bond over that. I should pick that up. Maybe I should try that. You know, yeah. it, it's not as if we live in a silo where we're not, um, ex where other information isn't accessible to us. Well, I read one time a story about Howie Long, even though he's a Raider, just <laughs> bear with me here. You know, so here's the, I mean, you're not going to be a manlier man than Howie Long. He's got three sons, all three, just like him, two played NFL, one's played, um, well, another one, all three have played professional sports. But how he had this rule with his boys, and I think it last I, as I read it, I think it's even today. To come in the house, you have to give me a hug and a kiss. I thought that's pretty. I mean, these are this is a manly man, right? Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but no no part of that detracts from that. And I think we've got to get past this stereotype because we we've got we almost have extremes again. Like I said, extreme be, extremes beget extremes. So on one hand, we got totally absent or passive dads. On the other hand, we've got the, the macho, dirty, hairy Rambo guy that this is what a man looks like. And, uh, and he's rough and he doesn't show affection. And, you know, he, when he bleed, he gets cut, he doesn't bleed and he doesn't hurt. And, and so that's what a real man looks like. And we've got some boys in the middle going, I don't, I don't like football. And you know, that time I got cut, it did hurt. And thinking maybe I'm not in a man. And I'm, I really believe it has this over the top extreme stereotype of what a real man looks like has led to some boys wondering, maybe I'm not really a boy. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot of people questioning their own gender, their own, you know, uh, identity. And I can't help but believe some of that is born from either not having someone around to model that or feeding off the extremism of society's stereotype of what a man looks like and not feeling like they're anywhere in between. So what do you do? Right. If you don't meet what everybody tells you is a man, then you question maybe I'm not a man. So then we gotta be we have to be careful about that. So a man could be wanting his son to be tough but at the same time pushing him to even question if he's really male. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and that is why the, all of us as dads have to be aware of our own failings because we're not always tough. Right. You know, and, and we're not always uh, with l unlimited energy or whatever. Right. Sometimes we will put a standard on our children that if we turn a mirror to ourselves, we don't meet up to. And, and that is one of the things when I, when I talk about the modeling mirror, you know, keeping that mirror on, on you, because if you think about this and you think about what you said with your brother and you about your dad, I should fully expect my son to grow up to be like, you, like me. And whatever it is that I want in him the best way for me to achieve it is to put it in me. And whatever it is about him 
that I don't want to be like me, the best thing for me to do is to rid it from me, right? And that, I think, when we apply that concept, really tempers some of these standards. You know, I want my son to be Rambo. Well, you're not Rambo. <laughs> you, yeah. you know what I mean? <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. You know, so so you have, you have, and what I mean by that is I think you're right. You've got some of these father types that may think they're Rambo, but then it's, you know, it's eight o'clock at night and they're passed out on the couch because they're not Rambo, right? They actually run out of bullets, you know? Yeah. <laughs> they're not yeah. able to, you know, anyway, I'll, I'll shut up. Well, and when, and when we do exhibit characteristics and traits that are not desirable, in fact, that are wrong, we need to own it because they, they need to at least know that's not right. But if we do it and we never own it, never admit it, maybe we even excuse it, then, then why wouldn't they think that's just normal? So a man's had a bad day, loses temper, blows up, verbally assaults his wife. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, that, is, that, that can happen, but what can't happen occasionally, what can't happen is I never admit that. I never own it. I never go to her and say, that was, I'm so sorry. I never go to the kids and say, guys, that was wrong. That was me just being the wrong, uh, you know, and, and even apologizing to them. Many times I've had to go to my kids and say, I'm sorry. Now what you did was wrong, but the way I responded was also wrong. Out of frustration and anger, and that's wrong too. They need to know that. Otherwise, the only other option is they view that as a normal behavior and, and it's not, and it, it's not acceptable. Oh yeah. We, having the humility to say you're sorry and that you messed up and to constantly reinforce that right versus wrong, even in you, you know, what I did that, that you saw me do was wrong, <laughs> yeah. but, but also how you remedy the wrong is you work to change the behavior and you admit that you are wrong in your kids, even from your own mistakes can learn from that. Yeah. You know, I won't ask you but um, to answer this, but I'll, I'll, I'll say something. And then if you want to chime in, you know, feel free. But one of my most humbling parent moments was uh, I was my son's baseball coach. He's playing second base. And I, I was a hustling guy, right? When I, when I was an athlete, I always was, we had this award in high school for every team, most inspirational. And I was on eight different teams and I won that award seven times, right? Okay. So <laughs> no so, surprise to yeah. anybody who knows you. <laughs> okay. Well anyway, but but notice I didn't win MVP. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. But but so I've always expected, you know, my son, I want you to play hard and give your best, blah, blah, blah. Well, he was being lazy out on the field. And then he was our leadoff hitter and and he comes up to bat and just lethargic and whatever. And I'm, you know, ah, well, he gets a hit and he gets the first base and I'm upset, right? Can't believe my son's being lazy. And I look at his face and his face, his lips are pale. He's about to hurl, you know, and then he does like, like five seconds later, right? And it was, it's one of those things where if I could back it up, as opposed to assuming the worst about my kid, right? I, I would have thought, you know, what's wrong, right? What's wrong? Right. And so let's just say I've apologized for that <laughs> four million times. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You know. Um, and, and whenever my son gets his first car or something, it'll probably be because he leveraged that moment. <laughs> well, what happened there is two things. Number one, there's been, there's no doubt anymore. Dad's not perfect. But number two, dad's humble enough to admit he is wrong. And it, isn't that, I mean, there's no downside to that. And even if it takes you eating some crow <laughs> to accomplish that, it's worth it. Yeah. So, so what, go ahead, go ahead. No, that, that was it. Yeah, I, I, let's, um, let's tackle one last thing and, and, and we can call it a conversation. But um, the Bible, right? You mentioned creation, um, God's plan. Uh, does the Bible have anything to say about fathers? <laughs> well, you know, not like a ton, but I would say not a, a ton for mothers either. I, the, obviously, the first one that comes to mind, not only does is it 
gender specific. I think it's even gender characteristic specific, where he says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Um, Ephesians 6, 4. And that word to wrath means uh, literally to exasperate. So again, you've got these extremes. You've got fathers who either aren't there or who are just totally passive. And the ones who expect a boy to wear a man's pants. And, uh, and one of the ways that fathers can exasperate their children is to have too high of expectations, to expect too much, to demand too much, to, again, to expect a boy to be wearing a man's pants. And uh, he doesn't say that to mothers. Right. And, you know, and if you knew mothers and fathers, you know he didn't need to tell mothers that. It's the men he needed to tell that to. And so, uh, I mean, obviously, there are a lot of characteristics, character traits that all of us had to ought, ought to have that translate very well to parenting. But if you want to talk about specific instructions to fathers, it's that one. Yeah. Don't, don't. Yeah. Now, some people say, well, it says don't make him mad. No, he didn't take the trash out. Like I told him, I'm going to punish him. He's going to be mad. That's not what, that's not at all. What, what Paul is saying is don't cause him to be exasperated. Because you know what happens with an exasperated child is they feel like they can't win. That's right. And if they can't win, there's nothing to lose. That's it. And why so, try? Why try? Yeah, why try? And then when I finally get to make my own decisions, I'm out of here. That guy can no longer lord over me. He can no longer be overbearing on me. I'm out of here. So, uh, yeah, that's the first uh, biblical uh, command that I can think of for fathers. That's the first one that comes to my mind. Well, yeah, you know, and so uh, in, in light of that scripture and, and its application, it's one of the reasons why um, I think it's important as parents for us to give a yes with a no and a no with a yes. And what I mean by that is, you know, uh, can I go play with my friends? Yes, you can, but you got to be back by the be back by is the no. It's an inherent boundary around it. Yes, you can, but here's the limit. Right. And then in the flip side, you know, there are going to be times you're going to say, no, you can't. Right. No, you can't. But next week you can, or when you've proven yourself, you can, when you, right. So that, that in, in the, in the combination of the two, you don't spoil a child who only gets yes. And you don't ruin the child because they only get no's because the seed of rebellion, I think is sowed in this sense that a child can develop, I cannot win, right? Right. Because once I know that I can't, there's not a rule, that the rules are set where I can never win, why even play by the rules? Yeah. The rules have to be set in such a way that I feel like if I follow the rules, I can get to my objective, right? But if I can never get to it, then why play? I break it all and I just go out and do what I want. Yeah. Well, what about the you know, the child comes home with a, uh, with their final exam grade and it's a 97 and you know, there's the dad 97. Why didn't you, why didn't you make a hundred? Yeah. I mean, how crushing, right. so, you know, the kid is so proud. He studied hard. He made a 97. He yeah. comes home with it and it's not good enough. And this idea that you're never, it's never good enough is exasperating to anybody, so, to a yeah. spouse, to an employee. Uh, I think it was Charles Spurgeon, but I don't know. I think it was. Somebody said, nobody sins more unreservedly than one with no hope. Mm. It makes sense, doesn't it? So without hope, it's exasperating for the young child. It can lead to complete rebellion in the older child. And so uh, we, need to be, we need to be engaged, but we need to be engaged in a way that's productive. Before we wrap it up, I, I yeah, thought of yeah. something while we've sure. been talking. Sure. Back in my day, I'm so old, um, <laughs> being engaged with your children, I feel like was easier than it may be now. And I'll tell you why, because of this. Um, now, now, this now could keep the father from being engaged because he's, you know, he's got to check out all the tweets and, you know, everything else. <laughs> got to keep up with Marcellus Wiley, right? Yeah, but, <laughs> but even if he decides I'm going to be engaged, guess what? Everybody else in the house has. So when I was a kid, there's nothing to do in the room. 
shared a room with my brother. There was nothing in there. That we didn't have a TV in the room. We, we only had one. It was huge, and it didn't have a remote, and you only got three channels. And we all kind of were in the same room in the evening. You know, my, maybe my dad's reading the paper, but we're in the same room. I feel like, and this is not easy to do, but I feel like fathers today are going to have to insist that their children are available mm -hmm. to be engaged with. Because even if he's willing, but he just kind of lets them, well, well, they wanted to. Now, that's a lot easier for him. He's going to say, well, I wanted to, but they were all TikToking, you know. <laughs> um, but no, I think I don't know how to go about it in the best way. I don't have the answers for all of this, but I do think that today, given the, the every other distraction that's out there, he's going to have to be intentional about being engaged and being involved and, and doing that in a productive way. Oh yeah. And, and let's, you know, let's run with that, that idea of intentionality. You brought it up at the beginning and, and we can close out with it. You know, one of the things that I like to ask parents, especially parents with new, new children, is I ask them to list the characteristics they want in their child when they're 25. You know, when your child is 25, what are the characteristics you want? And then the important question is, say, what are you doing today to end up with that result? Because how often are we so unintentional about our parenting? You know, I... I, I too often here, well, when they turn 18, when they turn 18, when they turn 18. Well, 18 is just 17 and 357 days or something, right? Like, like it's just one more day than 17. So, so what is the difference, right? The maturation of the child and their development into an adult isn't a magic number, right? And, and even in our law, we're, we're, we're shifting things off of 18, right? You know, now you can be on your parents' medical insurance so you're, I think, 26. And I mean, there, this is a shifting thing. So it's about a progression, and that progression can't happen unless you're intentional about it, right? Otherwise, you're, you're just flipping a coin and hoping my kid turns out right and not saying, here's where I hope they end up. And here's what I'm doing to hope that they end up there. And that mindset alone should create, you talk about willpower, create some energy around being engaged and saying, you know, get off of TikTok and let's, let's do this other thing that is much more productive. Yeah. It's, it's not easy. Uh, nothing about parenting is easy. You want something easy, don't be a parent. Really, right. just just don't even go there. <laughs> yeah, right. It's going to be the hardest job ever. If you want and, to do it right, yes. Yeah, for sure. And if you don't do it right, it's probably going to be a lot of heartache after. Right. So, right. And it could be anyway. A lot of people have done it right as they could and still have a lot of heartache. So it's challenging and it's tough. And um, But, you know, back to the original point that you made, and, and that is the, the – power and the uh, the value of the father in the home yeah so this is great timing i know we're about to close uh madison tyler who are you there no they're on tiktok yeah. actually it can't be i think trump just banned it today oh okay say hi to say hi to keith okay this is hey. madison say hi to keith hey man Kids, we've been talking about how to be mean and harmful to you guys. <laughs> anyway, so so any final thoughts, Keith? No, I appreciate you, uh, you know, launching the discussion. It's a, it's a good reminder for me, probably for you as well. And then I hope that anybody who listens, um, you know, dads can feel kind of beat down and defeated as well. And uh, hopefully it's a reminder of your importance as well. Get, yeah, get yeah. involved. Be, don't be passive. Be involved. Be engaged, knowing how important you really are. Amen. Amen. No matter whether it's the culture that says you don't matter, whether it's somebody in your family that says you don't matter, or it's the person in the mirror that says you don't matter, all of it's a lie. Every man, every dad, every father matters, and we should live yep. like it. Yep. Thanks so much. All right. Enjoy it. You have a great day. You too. See ya. Bye bye.